Good evening. It's good to be here. I appreciate the the reading and particularly the song, um, David. As you can kind of see from the reading and the song, uh, before the prayer, we're going to be talking about Jesus and Thomas. Um, you know, mentioned a couple weeks ago, we're down to the last four or five lessons in this Life of Christ series that we've started a couple years ago. Um, this is one of the last events. I mean, there's, there's a few more between now and the Ascension, but uh, this account with Jesus and Thomas is, is obviously listed uh, strategically in this part of the book of John. Um, and, you know, all throughout history, there are famous household names. You know, there's people that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, what kind of background you come from, you know, you see a picture of them, and you know exactly what they're famous for. And I'll give you a couple examples. Most of us in here can see a picture of this, and we think of, you know, the first president. We think of Revolutionary War. You know, most of us are familiar with Thomas Jefferson. It's just a household name. You got Michael Jordan, right? You may not even be a fan of basketball, but most people can see a picture of him and recognize this is the greatest basketball player of all time. You know, you got Albert Einstein, one of the most famous scientists to ever live. You got the king of rock himself. You know, Elvis Presley, most people could recognize him easily. And arguably most the, the most famous household name is Pistol Pete himself, especially locally here. You know, definitely see a picture and you know who he is. You know, there's just these people, again, you just know who they are. You see their face, you know what they're famous for, and the Bible's no different, right? And you, you open up the Bible and you think of, you know, the burning bush. Naturally, we, we associate the name Moses to it. We, we hear about Goliath, and we think about David. You know, you can go on and on about just these, these household biblical names. And I think, you know, when we talk about the idea of doubting or the dangers of doubt, um, you know, I think, you know, it's hard-pressed not to have that conversation without bringing up Thomas. You know, doubting Thomas, a you know, nickname that we often hear him refer to, you know, it's kind of a, an unfortunate nickname. We'll talk about here in just a little bit on whether or not we feel like that that's a fair assessment of him, you know, but, you know, Thomas and, and this account between him and Jesus is a very well-known event following the resurrection. It's one that most of us have studied and heard about our entire lives, uh, but it's still a very important one. It's a very, there's a lot of basic fundamental truths within this account um, that really apply to us. And so what we're going to do, um, you know, is we're going to look about a little bit about who Thomas was and kind of just some piece, piece together some scriptures to help us get a better context of who he was as a person, maybe help us easily be better put in his shoes. Uh, we'll read the account again in its entirety and go back and make some con comments, and then we'll, we'll look at some, some closing takeaways. You know, but what do we know about Thomas? You know, I think, again, in order for us to really understand and put ourselves in his shoes and kind of understand what he was going through, what he was thinking when he had this encounter with Jesus, I think it's important to know to look at what we know about him. And, and unfortunately, like most of the disciples in the New Testament, there's not just a ton that's given to us just about who he was, you know, before we started following Christ. Uh, but there are several passages that we can kind of piece together and kind of get a better uh, conclusion about who he was. And number one is we know it; he was one of the 12. You know, in every one of the accounts of the Gospels where the 12 disciples are mentioned by name, you know, Thomas is listed in every single one of those. And this may seem obvious, but I think it's worth mentioning or reminding ourselves because what this means is, is that because he was one of the 12, Thomas was one of Jesus' closest friends. You know, he spent nearly three years of his life following with the rest of the disciples Christ and, you know, witnessing all of the great things that Jesus did during his life here on earth. You think about it, you know, Thomas, think about some of the things that he got to witness with his own eyes. You know, Thomas got to physically see Jesus raise people from the dead. He got to physically see Jesus heal the blind and the lame. You think about some of the lessons that Thomas got to sit near Jesus. You know, I would imagine he was probably at least very close to Jesus as he delivered the, the Sermon on the Mount. Just sitting there in person, taking the sin firsthand. You know, why this is important for us to remind ourselves of is because it helps sort of set the stage of where Thomas was coming from and really the rest of the disciples because at this point in time, you know, they were devastated. You know, this, this man, this, this Messiah that they devoted the rest of their lives following, he is now at this point dead. To them, they're, they're hopeless, they're, they're confused, they're, they're probably scared. They're just completely 
and utterly distraught at this point. And I think that's important to remember, again, when we're, when we're looking at Thomas as a person. You know, he's also called the twin. Three of the, the four different passages that um, mentions Thomas by name um, also refers to him as Didymus, which is the Greek word that literally means the twin. Um, even more interesting, you know, the, the modern day name Thomas, as we know it, comes from an Aramaic word called teamos, which again literally means the twin. And so, you know, it's very, you know, from what I could tell, it's, it's very likely that Thomas may not have even been real, his real name or what he was referred to by the disciples. In every translation, you know, he was called the twin. And you can read that from all, some of the passages that we'll look at here. Um, if you're like me, you're probably going to be disappointed to, to find that, unfortunately, the Bible doesn't really tell us if he was a twin or who his twin was. Um, that's kind of naturally where my mind went. I was curious to, to find and you know, there's just not enough, um, at least biblically speaking, that tells us or confirms this. There's some ideas and thoughts out there, but nothing that I felt worth um, going into too much in depth. But, you know, again, it's, it's worth mentioning because, you know, the Bible does often refer to him as Didymus or the twin. He's possibly a fisherman. Again, we don't really know what he did before he followed Jesus, but we do have this passage here in John 21 in verse 2, it says, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Sounds familiar, doesn't it, Kevin? <laughs> no, but you know, this passage obviously doesn't really specifically say that he was a fisherman, but... You know, we do know from other parts of the scriptures that Peter and, and James and John, before they started following Christ, that they were fishermen by trade. And we at least have this passage here where we see Thomas going fishing with them. He may have just been joining them for, for the fun. It may be something that he did, you know, as a profession. We don't know, um, again, but this is just kind of another passage that does list Thomas by name. We also have a pretty good idea that he died a martyr, um, just like a lot of the other apostles um, that spent the rest of their life preaching the gospel and then the good news. Um, Thomas, tradition has it, died around 72 AD in Malapur, India, um, by being speared to death with lances. So um, kind of an unfortunate, tragic ending that we have to his life. But, you know, why this is important, what it tells me is that even though he may have had this moment of weakness um, in this account that we're going to study here in just a second, you know, we do understand that, you know, use it as a, an opportunity to turn his life around or to, to devote his life spreading that good news, probably preaching his own testimony and some of the things that he witnessed. We also get from the scripture that, I, that Thomas was a loyal follower. You know, earlier back in the book of um, John, around chapter 11, you know, we, when you read the account of Lazarus dying, um, you know, when Jesus got word that Lazarus died, he wanted to go back to Bethany to see him. And this was a very kind of heated part, if you remember, of Jesus' ministry. And when he made mention that he wanted to go see the Lazarus, see the body, you know, the other disciples were, were afraid for him, right? They, they were like, no, you, you can't go back to Bethany. You know, you may get arrested, you may get killed, something bad's going to happen. You know, don't go back to Bethany. You know, and it was Thomas was the disciple that spoke up in verse 16 and said, you know, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas was the disciple who spoke up and rallied the other disciples to remind themselves that, hey, we're going to follow him. You know, we're going to do him. We're going to have his back. We're going to go back to Bethany. If that's where Jesus wants to go, we're going to go with him. We're going to even die with him if it's necessary. You know, which I think this tells a lot about me, of, you know, who Thomas was as a person and just kind of maybe having a more of an outspoken attitude than some of the other disciples, you know. But this tells me that he was a, a loyal follower. He was also, you can kind of get from Scripture, a devout student. In John chapter 14, starting in verse 1, it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, or that I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to them, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? 
know, we get from this, this passage here that, you know, Thomas is a little confused, maybe misunderstanding what Jesus is um, talking about here when he's referencing his death and his resurrection, just like a lot of the other disciples. Um, you know, but it was kind of Thomas's curiosity, it was his question, you know, that prompted Jesus to kind of go on and, and teach one of the more profound truths that we still talk about and study to this day. Pick, picking back up in verse 6, Jesus said, I, I said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So, again, Thomas's curiosity, wanting to just get clarification with what Jesus meant there, you know, Jesus gave him an answer. And this is something that, you know, we, we talk about and try to remind ourselves every single day. And this is kind of what we know about Thomas. Um, again, we're going to read the account here, but I think it was important to kind of just piece together some scriptures because the picture that I get of Thomas isn't this weak, feeble person, right? I think or maybe sometimes we paint him in such a, a negative context, right? When we, for example, you know, when we talk about Judas, you know, naturally we, we kind of cringe, we, we kind of clam up because, you know, we all the despicable things Judas did, and, and rightly so. And, you know, sometimes, at least for me, I've always kind of painted Thomas, maybe not in that extreme of a negative light, but looked down on him a little bit. You know, he was just called out for, for doubting the resurrection. And, you know, I just, I don't really know if that's quite fair. You know, when I originally, I like to title my lessons, and I originally t titled it Doubting Thomas. And after I started studying this a little bit further, I changed it back to, to Jesus and Thomas just because, you know, I don't know if it was... I don't know. It just didn't really sit well with me. You know, the Bible tells us that, you know, all, all the other disciples also doubted. It wasn't Thomas wasn't the single person that doubted the resurrection of Jesus. You know, but we don't talk about doubting Peter or doubting Matthew. And, you know, we'll kind of talk about here in just a second, right or wrong, you know, if, if you know, Thomas was in the wrong for, for doubting here. But, you know, I think it's important for us to know that Thomas looks to me as a, as a faithful follower of Jesus who was in a moment of weakness just distraught because his Messiah, his, one of his closest friends, is now buried and in a tomb. So as you think about that, I want to kind of go in and read the, the account again in its entirety. And we're going to go back and make some comments on it. And starting in verse 19, it says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when, he had, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and place, or see my hands, and put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen yet believed. One of the first things that we notice when we read this account is that Thomas was not with the disciples, the other disciples, when Jesus first appeared. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us where he was, doesn't tell us why he wasn't with them. Um, all we know is that he just wasn't with them at that present time. You know, odds are he was probably still hiding out, trying to lay low. You know, as you know, most of these accounts here, you know, the disciples were still pretty, pretty afraid. They, they were sh not sure what was going to happen next. You know, you think about, you know, when Jesus was getting crucified, they scattered. You know, these accounts that we read here in John, every time Jesus appeared to them, they were behind locked doors. 
you know, I think it's a very safe assumption that say that they were worried, right, that this Messiah, this man that, you know, they spent their entire lives devoting and following and learning after was just crucified, was just brutally killed, you know, makes sense that they were afraid that the Jews were going to come after them next. That's probably what I would have been thinking. So at this time, all the disciples were trying to lay low, trying to figure things out, what was next. So Thomas may have been just laying even lower. I don't know. Um, We just know that Thomas wasn't with them. And so when Jesus did appear to the other disciples, one of the first things that they did that the Bible tells us, they went and told Thomas. I don't know if there's any significance in that, but, you know, from what we gather here, the first person that they went and told this resurrection sighting to was their fellow friend Thomas. You know, they said, Thomas, you know, we've, we've seen Jesus. He's alive again. You won't ever believe it, right? And I don't, it's hard to ever get, you know, facial expressions or body language, but I have to believe Thomas was like, Psh, yeah, right. You know, I believe that you guys think that you saw Jesus, but there's no way that he's alive. There's no way we, we saw what he went through. We saw the amount of blood loss and the trauma that his just physical body went through. No one has ever physically been killed in that way and come back again to live to tell about it. You know, and if you ask me, I think that's a very reasonable reaction to this. Right? I mean, think about if if you were in his shoes, right? Think about someone maybe that you've lost that's been very close to you, whether that be a spouse or a parent or whoever. You know, and I come up to you and you say, hey, I I saw your dad walking around Walmart the other day. Talk to him. You know, haven't seen him in a while. You'd be thinking to me first, that's a little cruel. But second of all, that's that's impossible, right? That could never happen. And that's what Thomas was doing. Thomas says, no, unless I physically can see him, if I can physically touch his scars and put my hands in his side, then I'm going to believe. You know, Thomas, Thomas isn't saying that he's never, that there's no chance at all that he'll ever believe. He just needs a little bit extra convincing, a little bit more evidence before he's going to kind of jump on this wagon. He wasn't ready to kind of get his hopes and dreams crushed all over again just because, you know, some people were saying that they saw Jesus in the flesh. And so about a week later, eight days to be exact, you know, Jesus did exactly that. He appeared to them behind locked doors. They're still hanging low. And, you know, Jesus appeared and did exactly what Thomas asked, right? He, he presented himself. He told Thomas, hey, touch my scars. Put your hand in my side. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us whether or not Thomas actually touched him, but what it does say is he said, my Lord and my God. You know, make no mistake, Thomas believes now. There isn't no, are you really Jesus? Am I, am I seeing things? Am I hallucinating? No, he says, my Lord and my God. And would spend, again, the rest of his life, Preaching this good news, preaching, I would imagine, his own personal testimony. Maybe his own moment of weakness and how, you know, just seeing Jesus in the flesh turned things around. And then Jesus closed by saying, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And that's the account um, here. Again, it's a fairly familiar one. Um, one that we've studied a lot, but I want to cl- really spend the rest of our time looking at a few key takeaways. Just because, just like with all the other Life of Christ series and um, chapter studies we do, you know, there's a lot that we can take away. There's a lot that we can apply to our lives, and so I want to spend the rest of our time looking at that. Number one, as I put a little doubt and skepticism isn't always a bad thing, and I want to be careful in how I word that or the point that I, I make here because. I don't want you to think that I'm saying that this should be just a normal part of our routine. I don't think that there's ever any room for a established or a more mature Christian to constantly be doubting, let's say, the resurrection of Jesus or doubting the existence of God. I think with the proper amount of study um, and due diligence, it's easy to, to see the evidences that these things really did happen, that the resurrection was a factual event. Right? It just takes a little bit of digging, a little bit of studying to kind of help sort of push away some of those doubts that maybe we naturally have when we first decide to become a Christian. What I am saying, though, is if you look at it in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are for God. For many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come 
in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now in the world always, or in the world already. You know, any time that we're faced with a new belief or a new idea or something that maybe we haven't heard before, I think it's always important and critical for us to test those spirits, run it through the ultimate litmus test, you know, to see if these things are actually true to God's word. Because if we don't, you obviously run the risk of, you know, if you're just going to believe anything and everything someone tells you is truth, you know, you're going to be deceived. There's all types of ideas, some legitimate, some false, you know, so we have to be very careful on what we're just willing to just believe. So, you know, I think just having that little bit of doubt, maybe a little bit of skepticism when we're faced with a, with a, a new idea until we've been able to prove it factual, you know, is, is critical for our Christian faith. I think, you know, a couple examples that I think of is obviously Thomas. You know, I think to a point that's what Thomas was doing. Again, he, he eventually would come around to believe. He just needed a little bit more evidence, right? He just he needed to see it for himself personally that Jesus really did raise from the dead before he was going to believe. He wasn't just going to take anybody's word for it, even if they were the disciples. You know, I think about the Bereans in, the, in Acts, right? The Bible tells us that they would you know, search the scriptures daily to see if these things were so, right? That they were constantly practicing this idea of you know, searching the scripture, making sure that what they're believing and their ideas and their faith and everything that they do is based on doctrine. It's based on truth before they accept it as a part of their lives. And so I think as Christians, this is a, a, you know, a critical thing that we have to make sure that we're doing um, because the, you, know, you could obviously see the dangers of not um, testing the spirits. Be careful not to miss out. You know, we've already established that when Jesus first appeared to the disciples that you know, Thomas wasn't with him. We don't know where he was. We don't know. You know he may have very well had a very good, justifiable reason. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, Thomas was not with the other disciples. And I couldn't help but think, you know, this whole event, this whole un maybe unfortunate nicknaming could have been avoided if he was just simply there with them. You know, I think when I apply this to our lives, I think we have to do a better job collectively. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we could definitely see room for improvement of not forsaking any opportunities that we have to spend with our fellow saints, with other brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, it says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, I know life happens and things come up and we could talk about all the what-if situations, but you know, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we could all do a better job of prioritizing these opportunities of spending more time with one another, whether that be just at church, whether that be at Bible studies, at fellowship opportunities. You know, think about all the things, all the blessings that just simply come from just spending more time with other like-minded Christians. You know, I can't help but think you know, of all the churches across the world, particularly those that are across seas, that you know, meet every single week, risking their lives and potentially their freedom to just meet together one time or two times or how often they can. Right? All the things that they're risking to, to, to not forsake those assembling of themselves together. Yet, you know, sometimes we have a hard time coming to church on a, on a Wednesday night. Or, you know, attending a, a monthly Bible study. You know, there's just so many areas in our lives where we could do a better job prioritizing spending more time with one another than we do sometimes. So be careful not to miss out on those blessings. You know, sometimes people need to work out their own salvation. You know, I think this is more of a point of encouragement for, you know, our own personal evangelistic efforts. If we've been doing it long enough, we've all probably had certain situations where we are, you know, talking to someone new about the Bible, spreading the gospel, teaching them, you know, about the truth. And, you know, there's times where it seems like we have all of the right answers, all the, the correct answers to their difficult questions. We may have the best five-part study, you know, that anybody's ever seen, right? It just seems like things are going and, 
they just won't commit, right? They just won't take that final step. They're just, just not fully convinced. They just need a little bit more time. And sometimes those, those opportunities, if you've ever been in them, are sometimes discouraging. They're frustrating, right? You, you feel like you have the truth. You feel like just right there, just take that final step. Yet they just, they need to think about it a little bit longer. They need to work things out themselves. And, you know, I think sometimes that's just what needs to happen. You know, I think that that was the case here for Thomas. You know, in theory, Thomas, yes, he had all the evidence that he needed to believe that Jesus really did raise from the dead. But for Thomas, personally, he just needed a little bit more evidence, a little bit more um, proof that Jesus really did raise from the dead. And so, you know, when you're in those situations, don't get discouraged. Don't get beat down because, you know, someone's not committing or they're not progressing as fast as we would like them. You know, keep watering, keep planting, and let God give the increase, you know, in those situations. And usually, you know, if they're true, if they, if they have a genuine spirit about themselves that are wanting to change, those, wants, wanting to do the right things, and they've been presented with God's truth, more times than not, they come around, even if it's, again, not at the timeline that we would like them to. Number four, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. I want to spend a few minutes looking at this particular phrase because I think it's, it's something that shouldn't be glossed over. Um, it's, a, it's an important statement that Jesus makes here. You know, there's a lot of atheists, there's a lot of non-believers who like to accuse Christians of believing blindly. You know, they say that we you know, believe in the Bible, we believe in all this stuff without any type of evidence, without any type of proof that it really is factual, that it's real. You know, and some, you know, would even point to this passage and double down and say that's what Jesus is saying here, you know, that, that you're even more blessed if you're just willing to believe blindly without ever seeing any kind of factual proof. And ironically, I think the, you know, what Jesus, the point that Jesus was trying to make here is, is quite the opposite, and I think it's fairly easy to, to demonstrate. You know, if you, you look at a little bit of the context, you know, after Jesus, you know, appeared to Thomas um, and let you know, Thomas see him in the flesh and ultimately believe, Jesus goes on to describe two different groups of people. You know, he says that on one hand, there's those who have seen and believed. You know, and this would be a lot of those people there in that first century who got to physically see Jesus in the flesh before he ascended back to heaven. This would be like Mary and the disciples and the great multitude of people who got to physically see him. And he said, on the other hand, there's those who have never seen, yet they still believe. You know, this would be the vast majority of the rest of, you know, Christians that's ever lived on the earth that never got to physically witness Jesus in the flesh. This would be like you and I here today. You know, so the question is, is that, does that mean, are we believing blindly? Just because we've never got to see Jesus raised from the dead, are we just believing in this sort of, without any type of evidence or with any type of hope? And you know, the answer that I would argue is say absolutely not. You know, we do have the evidences. We don't, it's a different type of evidence, right? Yes, we weren't there to actually physically see Jesus. We never got to physically place our hands in his side. You know, but what we do have is we have eyewitness testimonies of people who did. You know, we got to first account witnesses. People who were there that did maybe get to physically touch Jesus, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things, and that's what we place our faith in. That's what we place our evidence in. And, you know, we can go a whole nother couple hours, you know, talking about the validity of the Bible, you know, and I think that that's why we study that, because, you know, if the Bible's not valid, then, you know, then we don't have those, the, the evidence that we need we, to, to believe um, in our faith. But um, Trevor Till talked about that last summer, so we're going to say we've already had that discussion. We believe that the Bible's valid. And so knowing that, you know, that's, that's what we place our faith in. That's what we place our evidence in. And if you continue on, and I'm not going to go into this in a whole lot of depth because I believe David Minson is going to talk about this next week, but continuing in the passage in verse 29, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
7, and it says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. You know, we tried to make this kind of an anchor verse um, for these last several lessons in this Life of Christ series because, you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, if, if Jesus really did raise from the dead, then everything else is pointless. You know, the work of the cross is not complete without the resurrection. You know, the resurrection has to be true for any of this, the rest of this stuff to matter. And so I say that to encourage you, if you've ever had any doubts that Jesus really did raise from the dead or that he exists, I encourage you to, you know, study them out personally. Again, the evidence is there. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't take a, a, just a super crazy Bible scholar to, to prove, you know, that some of these things did happen. It's there. You know, it's just up to us to, you know, study it out for ourselves and convince ourselves. And so, you know, it's important for us to understand, that, you know, that this is fact, that this did really happen. You know, we talked last time about the Great Commission and, you know, our responsibility as Christians going out and spreading this good dude and good news and baptizing people and, and you know, helping people become disciples. Well, none of that matters unless we come to grips with this truth first and foremost. So, again, if you're having any doubts, um, you know, we'd like to help you out with those this evening. If you've never been baptized and would like to be baptized for the remission of your sins, we'd like to assist you with that as well. If you need either one of these, we ask you to please come forth and stay on the front row as we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>